Hey guys, today we are in Revelations chapter 3. Remember, we're coming off Friday of reading chapter 2, where Jesus is talking to these seven particular churches at a particular time with particular issues. Um, and so we saw on Friday the first four of the seven churches, the church without love, the suffering church, um, the worldly church, uh, the church that tolerates sin. And today we'll see the three other churches. So we see in verse one, we start with the church that is in Sardis or Sardis. Um, uh, knowing Sardis, Sardis is an outreach ministry of Paul when he was in Ephesus. Um, Sardis was uh, one of the wealthiest cities in all of Asia Minor. Um, but what was interesting about it is that it was fixated on the idea of death. Um, even today, you can go to a place that's called the Graveyard of a Thousand Hills. Um, they were fixated and they loved death and kind of worshiped death. And so Jesus writes to them and he says, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead, right? Using this, what they're used to. We've noticed Jesus is using what every city is known for to bring up to them um, if they are good or if they are bad. So here he says, you look like you're alive, but you're dead. Kind of like a museum, right? You go and the animals look alive, but they're not. They look like they're Christians, but they are not. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your works complete in the sight of my God. Motions were not enough. God also wanted their heart the same today. Remember then what you received and heard, God's gospel, God's word, and keep it or do it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Now, we've heard this analogy before with Jesus talking about the second coming. This is not referring to the second coming. Jesus is just saying that he will come to judge the church. Um, and so he says, you better get it together or I'm coming to judge the church. Yet you have a few names, you have a few Christians in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments or soiled their character, uh, and they will walk with me for in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. That is a promise not only to the Christians of Sardis, but to the Christians today. If you believe in Jesus Christ, um, you are promised heaven. God will never take you out of heaven. Uh, I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels. Jesus will even advocate uh, advocate for those Christians who are faithful to him. He who has an ear, let him hear uh, what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's church number five. Now, church number six, the church of Philadelphia. Uh, this is the second church where Jesus is not going to say that there's a problem. This is this is a good church. And, and Philadelphia is known as the faithful church. It's the faithful church. And so he writes to uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a gateway um, to the east, uh, to the east of Asia Minor. Uh, it's the center of several trade routes, so kind of everything runs through Philadelphia. But what's interesting about it is it's located on the edge of a volcano. But because of this activity, uh, its ground is perfect and super rich in soil for um, vineyards, for grapes. And that's kind of what it's known for. And so here he says, I write to the church of Philadelphia, the words of the Holy One, true one who has the key of David, the key of David. The word key simply means the authority. If you have a key to a door, you have the authority to enter that door. But the key to David. Now, why King David? Remember, there was a promise. God made a promise. It's called the Davidic covenant, the David covenant um, that says that there will be a king from the line of David. Um, who will always sit on the throne and who will rule. The Messiah, the king, will come from um, David. So here he's saying God, Jesus, has the key of the Messiah, has the authority of the Messiah, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one's open. God is sovereign. Nobody can do what God already does. He tells them, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door and no one is able to shut. I know that you uh, that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
That little power simply means that Philadelphia was not a large church. It was a very small church. And not meaning that that's a negative thing. A small church is not a negative thing. And he even says this, you're small in size, but you are faithful. You have not denied my name and you have kept my word. Those are some good words to live by. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, we've seen this phrase before. Remember the church of Smyrna, um, uh, chapter two, verse nine. Uh, and he says, I will make those um, who are at the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I've never loved you. He's reminding them um, that all things will bow down uh, to Jesus in the end times. And um, because we are heirs of Jesus, because we are adopted into family, they will also bow down to us because we are children of God. Um, verse 10, because you have kept my word about uh, patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial. He says, I, I will be faithful because you have been faithful to me. I will be faithful to you and I will keep you from the hour, the hour of trial that is coming. And Jesus tells them, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have that no one may seize your crown. He's just saying that Jesus has your crown. No one can take their crown that Jesus holds on to their eternal life. Verse 12, the one who conquers, this is another name for a Christian, 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, um, the one who conquer, the Christians, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and never shall he go out of it, and will write, and I will write on him the name of God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God. So notice here, God is telling, Jesus is telling this church that he says, for you Christians um, who are holding on, he says, you will never go out of heaven, never shall you go out of it, that's heaven, and I will write my name on you, that's ownership. You don't write your name on things that is not yours, you write your name on things because they are yours. So God will write his name upon us, and we will be um, allowed to the um, in the name of the city of God, heaven, the new Jerusalem. So we see this complete ownership and this blessing of faithfulness that God gives us. Um he who has an ear, let him hear. And then we come to the last church, um, Laodicea or Laodicea, however you want to pronounce it, it's okay. This is known as the lukewarm church, the lukewarm church. There's a couple of things you need to know uh, about this so that it makes sense, okay? So Laodicea, um, what's interesting is the first pastor of Laodicea um, is uh, Philemon's son. You remember Philemon out of the Bible, Philemon, his son, um, Archippus, was uh, the first pastor. And so um, that's pretty interesting. Also, it was built on a plateau about 800 feet above the valley below it. So it's on a plateau. So it they built um, aqueducts and they got all of their water kind of brought up to them because they're at the top. Uh, so they're at the top and below them is a city named Colossae. We would know this city by Paul writes a letter to them named Colossians, the people of Colossae. Um, but not only was it um, uh, Laodicea at the top, and not only was it Colossae at the bottom, but a little ways over, there was another city, and they created what we would call today a tri-cities, right? Three larger cities that are close together. This other city was a city um, named Herapus, okay? And so what's interesting about this is Colossae, was known for cold water. They would get the snow, uh, the melting snow running off of that plateau uh, from Laodicea and it would run down. And so Colossae would have it and they would pump their water up to them. But then um, Herapus is a city uh, a little ways away and it was known for its hot springs. And so they would pump water in there. So they had cold water coming in and they had hot water coming in. Colossae had cold water. Herapus had hot water. Uh, and now um, you have Laodicea was having cold and hot water coming in. They built aqueducts. Many of them are still there today. You can go and see one of these aqueducts today um, that they built. And so... Um, uh, that's what it was. Uh, also, because of all of this, it was had a um, kind of a world-renowned medical 
um, school, and it was known uh, for their ISAF, um, th this, this element of hot water and cold water and these minerals that it brought would make this ISAF that was really great for uh, medicinal purposes. Now, let, let's read, and hopefully this makes sense. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot, right? So he's working off of what they know. Um, would that you were either cold, uh, uh, cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I will vow. I will spit up. I will vomit. I will puke you out of my mouth. You're not one way. You're not the other. You're kind of in the middle wishy-washy. For I say, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, the church of Laodicea, they put a lot of their faith into their money. Um, they were also known for the export of black wool uh, that made them very rich along with their medical um, kind of facility. Um, but they, they kind of lived that way. And so here God says, you put all your money in uh, all, all of your faith in money, but you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. You really don't have anything. He says, I counsel you to buy from me. What would we buy from God? That means that we would get salvation from God, right? I counsel you to get salvation from me, gold refined by fire, priceless salvation, so that you would be spiritually rich and white garments, righteousness, so that you would clothe yourselves in the shame of nakedness may not be seen. And the salve, that medical salve to anoint your eyes because they're spiritually blind. So when you know the context of these cities, it's so much easier to understand why God is using this. This is what every person in that city and every person in Asia Minor knew about not only this city, but every city. And so God wants them to buy salvation so that they would truly be righteous, so that they would um, be uh, refined by fire, they would be pure, and that they would have good eyesight, spiritual eyesight that they would see. Those whom I love, this is a universal love, um, kind of like we see in John three sixteen. This is not a love that they are Christians. He says, those whom I love, universal love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. God says, I love you. So I'm giving you some tough love so that you will come to faith. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking. Will you open it and accept him? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This idea of eating with somebody, um, in those days, you would eat evening meal, you'd eat supper or dinner um, with somebody, and you only did this with people that you liked. Sometimes we we eat with people and we don't really know them. You kind of eh, just kind of like, okay, well, let me, you invite somebody out and they go out to eat. But in those days, you only ate with people that you truly enjoyed and wanted to have fellowship. And here Jesus says, I, I want that fellowship with you. I want to eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will, uh, the one who is righteous, the one who is faithful, the one who believes in Jesus, um, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne. Notice this. Jesus says you can even share in the throne in which I sit on. Um, also, as also I conquered and sat down with the father on my throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says. And so here, as we finish up this, we finish up the seven churches and remember chapter one, John told him to write down the things that are and are of the things to come. So here, as we've looked through these seven churches, we've seen problems in these seven historical churches that really no longer exist. Except for today, as Christians, we read these seven churches, and in these seven churches, these are all problems within our churches today. And so the question is, as we read these seven churches, are, is this what's happening at Green Acres? Because he's writing to real churches. Is this what's happening to the Christian faith? Um, you go back and you look at these, these names. Are we a church that has love? Are we a church that's suffering for the sake of the gospel? Are we a worldly church? Are we a church that tolerates sin? Are we a dead church? Are we a faithful church? Uh, are we a church that is lukewarm? And so even though it's written 
to churches in the past, it still has great reference for us today. And starting tomorrow, as we get into chapter four, we will turn our eyes from the past and start looking to the future of what Jesus truly wants um, these churches, these seven churches he wrote to, and also us today as Christians. Hope that makes sense. We'll see you tomorrow in chapter four. God bless.